So thank you for, it's really cool to come here. Uh, I came here by plane, which I wasn't very happy about because I'm terrified of flying. And as a, as a security analyst, I know this doesn't make sense at all. I know this, but it doesn't matter. I'm still terrified. Um, the last time I was doing a speech uh, or a talk like this, I was going by a high-speed train, which was much, much nicer. It has the same uh, probability of dying, so to speak, but it still feels so much better. Also, I could use this chip implant that I have in my hand as a ticket on the high-speed trains in Sweden, which is kind of cool. Um, no, so it didn't just, how, how come that planes are so secure? How come that trains are so secure? Well, I'm, I'm just thinking, what if we would make a startup for planes uh, in the same, on the same basis that we're doing startups in the ITs. Um, let's try to make this. So I'm thinking, well, I, I don't really have a license to do like planes, but I think it will be working out fine anyway. And I think I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus on one thing, and that's gonna be the interior design and like aer aerodynamics. I don't know. Doesn't. <coughs> We, we, can, we can figure it out as we go, I think. Um, I think we're going to make the body of this plane uh, out of uh, plastic, because that's light and it's cheap. And yes, it's proven not to withstand lightning, but we put that in the manual. And also, a skilled pilot would avoid, flight, uh, would avoid lightning, so it doesn't matter. Um, is there anyone who would board this plane. Still, this is how we do in IT and in the IOTs. So, uh, since this is an IOT talk, I, of course, have to start with uh, some kind of definition of Internet of Things, and I'm going to use a very, very broad definition. Um, we can talk about sensors, moving parts, and computers, and they all need to be connected. And most of these uh, um, devices also collect privacy data, uh, which is one of the biggest issues. Uh, the business model is often built upon collecting that uh, privacy data instead of, for example, selling products. Because at the moment, there is obviously no money in, in uh, selling the products. Uh, Bruce Schneier, who is an IT security guru, so to speak, uh, he is claiming that we are building a world-sized robot with the Internet of Things. Uh, he is claiming that the sensors are the eyes and the ears of this robot. The moving parts are the arms and legs of uh, this robot. And the connectivity and computers uh, is the brains. And then we're giving that world-sized robot all of this data about us. Is that, uh, does it sound like a perfect idea? I don't know. Uh, so I've promised you that I'm going to talk about um, things that I have found out uh, living uh, in uh, IoT labs and using my own body as an IoT lab, basically. So it's, uh, for me, it started some years ago when I moved into an apartment that um, had an, an alarm that would give a push notification to my boyfriend every time that I would leave the house. And of course, my first, the first red flag in my head was, well, this can be used for domestic violence, uh, like against any partner or any kid, like you, uh, what kind of beautiful ways that you can have to control your partners. And uh, when I'm talking about beautiful, I mean the difference to beautiful, uh, the opposite of beautiful. Uh, but it's very, you can use it as a very efficient way of, uh, of oppression of your near and dear. Um, 
And his argument against this was, of course, that the tool doesn't make the use case. So guns don't kill people, people kill people. And sometimes things happen by accident. Um, and of course, in this, problem, in this um, project, um, it wasn't a problem. Uh, it, it, it never became, never came to domestic violence in this case. It was never an issue, really. Um, I think the biggest issue was possibly that uh, when I was out, and I could see that, oh, he hasn't left the house, house until two in the evening. Like, he, he's wasting his life. <laughs> um, like, is this really something that we want to know about our partners? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Um, I think that IoT is an extremely interesting and powerful tool. And as any tool, it can be used for good and for bad, and it can also be used for accidents. So um, let's take another example. We have the fission power that can give us cancer treatments. Or we have, uh, but it can also give us the North Korea-American situation. Uh, or, and it can also give us uh, Sella Field, Harrisburg, Fukushima, and, and Chernobyl. Uh, this is a very strong tool, and it's not necessarily so that we actually have the control over it all the time. We have to be aware of that. The aforementioned Bruce Schneier he claims that there are two paradigms of how we make security in the IoT. And the first one is the paradigm that comes from the physical world of highly regulated dangerous things. And these things are highly regulated because they have historically been very dangerous. So if, you're, if we're making, if we're using plastic in the body of the plane, people will die. So you're not allowed to do that. Or you can do that, but you can put some uh, aluminum mesh over it so, to make it into a fire cage. Uh, but you, you can't cut corners in the same way because people will die. And the way that we ensure that people don't cut corners is through regulation. On the other side, we have the other paradigm of agile, patchable security of things that thus have been very benevolent, like computers or like just tracking my body, uh, my bodily functions in order to uh, be better at uh, biking or running, which is what I mean by biohacking. And in the IoT, these two uh, worlds cl clash together so that we, for example, have medical devices uh, with connectivity that uh, if, they, uh, if we find uh, a security issue with them uh, and we need to update it like we usually do in the agile security paradigm, uh, that may void the certification that that uh, medical device has, become, uh, has uh, received from the FDA. It may or may not. We are not totally sure about this. But it uh, sure makes it, uh, it's not very nice to, to like put millions and millions into a device and then all of a sudden, because you did the right thing, you're not allowed to sell it anymore. So what Bruce Schneier is saying is that we need to regulate the Internet of Things. He's also saying that this must come from us as a community because otherwise regulation will happen to us and it will happen to us in a very unnice way. And I think that people like Bruce Schneier or people that were around in the 90s that were there for the crypto wars know that if you're leaving the regulation to the policymakers, they will probably make something that isn't very useful and isn't very efficient. But what he's claiming is that we need we need to find a way to make this work, and we are the only ones who can do that.
I'd also like to take a quote from him. Uh, the market can't fix this issue with... Uh, um, um, so the context here is the Mirai bot botnet from November, where um, badly secured devices uh, were used to orchestrate a DDoS attack against another security researcher, but also against uh, Twitter and stuff. And we see this like <laughs> more or less every month nowadays that uh, badly secured IoT devices are used uh, in order to take down other sites. So in this case, there is an externality uh, created. So the market can't fix this because neither the buyer nor the seller cares. And this is what um, this issue is what economists call an externality. It's an effect of the purchasing decision that affects other people. And we can think of it as invisible pollution. Um, one of my, before I went into the cybers, I was going to be an environmental economist. And uh, the first, second, and third thing that you have to learn in environmental economist, uh, economics is we need to internalize the externalities. So this is something that uh, we, we can learn from other fields about. Uh, and there are, I can see at least, at least three ways of internalizing these externalities, uh, making the industry pay for itself, um, And the th first one, I think, so there's the issue that neither the buyer nor the seller cares about IoT security. But I would disagree about this. I think that the buyer does care. But the buyer has no idea how to differentiate between a device that is somewhat secured, a device that has some kind of uh, agile practices that have uh, vulnerability disclosure policies and one that doesn't. So what I and others would like to propose is simply to have uh, a voluntary seal. Uh, and then we can look back at the environmental movements again. We have lots of different seals here and uh, this one is very known for the Swedish population and we all know this. We know that if you want to make the ethical choice when it comes to, um, to ecology, we look for this. And the same here with the echo label. If we want to do a more ethical choice, if we care about the externalities that are created by us uh, buying these products, we look out for this and we know what this is. This is something that is communicated to people, er, everyday people, and you don't have to be an environmental scientist to understand some of the basics of this. And to my knowledge, there is uh, not yet uh, a seal for IoT security out there, and I think it uh, must come soon. I know there are initiatives for it. The second way that I think that this market will change is that we have the threat of ransomware. So if you're having a very badly, badly secured device, uh, you are vulnerable to ransom. And this is something that is very bad brand damage to, to the seller and to the vendors. And this is something that people actually have in their mind and they don't want. They, don't, they obviously don't want their Roomba to, to uh, be ransomed. Of course not. Uh, and there is another very interesting uh, version of a crypto locker um, that is called the Bricker Bot that functions in the same way that a, um, a normal ransomware does, but except for, uh, instead of leaving a ransom note of give me this and this many bitcoins, it just bricks your device. End of story. You will never get the key back. 
the pe person who uh, is claiming that he is the creator of this Brickerbot is saying that what he's doing is internet chemotherapy. <laughs> so no one in their right mind would go through chemotherapy if they weren't severely sick. And he's claiming that the internet and the internet of things is severely sick. And he's taking, um, taking it into his own hands. Uh, disclaimer, I of course don't think that anyone should brick other people's devices. It's illegal. But threats like this will make the world better. I'm sorry. It's the truth. The third way that I think will, um, we will internalize the externalities of the IoT is through the General Data Protection Regulation, which is a regulation, of course. Um, there are different kinds of regulations. We have the CE mark, for example, that is a certification that you need pre-approval, and it costs money to do. Uh, and when you have gone through there, you are approved to sell your electronic devices in, in the EU. And then five years later, even though your product hasn't changed, you still need another one of those approval processes, and it actually needs to go through, and it's very costly, and it uh, takes a lot of time. The general data protection regulation is working in uh, kind of the opposite way, that instead of you doing pre-approval, um, you, instead of asking for permission, you're asking for forgiveness. Uh, so you can do whatever you want, but if personally identifiable information is leaked, you are fined and you are supposed to be severely fined. We don't know if this is actually what's going to happen because um, uh, it only comes in force in May 2018. Uh, so it may very well be another one of those regulations that never work. And that's the issue about regulations, that we often think about the successful ones and say, hey, regulation works, we should totally do regulation. Uh, but then we forget about those that don't work or have the opposite effect. Think EU cookie law. The only thing that the EU cookie law is like, it doesn't make sense at all. You can basically use it as a fishing <laughs> technology. It's a, uh, it, it's, it, it's a mess, you know? There are so many regulations that haven't been working out before. So why would regulation work this time? Maybe it does. Um, and I think that the general data protection regulation, with the right push from the communities like this, uh, people that care about privacy and, um, and know about their rights. Uh, it can make a very big difference, and not only in the EU, but in the global market. So one of the things that you can do, for example, is that you can say uh, today already, like, hey, I want you to erase my data. And I, I'm doing that uh, nowadays. Every now and then I'm like, oh, I don't want this account anymore. So I call their support, and it may take between one and 10 minutes to find the email address. Obviously not calling, but mailing. Uh, and I'm saying, hey, I'd like to use my right to be forgotten. And most of the time I get the answer, what? <laughs> and so in eight months, or seven months, I, I can't count at the moment. Um, they will be fined if they can't uh, erase you and erase you soon after you ask for it. But most of the industry still doesn't even, isn't even aware of this. Another great thing about the general data protection regulation is that if your, uh, if the, your personal identifiable information is leaked, uh, they have to tell the authorities, and they have to tell the authorities within 72 hours. And if you are neg negligent and have no clue about what infrastructure you have or what application you have, that's tough luck. You still have to... Uh, report and you still have to do this. You still have to comply all the time. 
but they are not checking you beforehand. So I have very high hopes in this, and I would love all you guys to join me in the quest for uh, our personally identifiable information, making it actually owned by us, because it is very clearly owned by us. Well, the second part of this talk uh, starts with this chip implant that I have in my hand. So, uh, almost two years ago, uh, I was tipped off to go to this after work seminar um, in the town where I live in Malmö, uh, where you can get a chip implant into your head, hand, not head. <laughs> uh, that's a tiny, tiny bit different. Uh, but for me, it felt like uh, it would be into your head because I thought that anyone who would do this ha lacks the basic risk assessment capability and must be really, really stupid. Who here thinks that I must be really, really stupid to do this? Oh, there's only one, two, okay. Oh, uh, liars. <laughs> <laughs> Polite. Yeah. Yes, you're all polite. Uh, so I, I went there to that party saying no one in the right mind want to do, could do this. And then I went through the, uh, I, I saw the presentation and people were doing it and I felt the instant urge to do this. So in 40 minutes I had gone from, I, I had swapped 180 degrees. And this was so interesting to me. What had just happened? Why did it work out like this? Um, so I started to research this, and uh, um, some months later, at the next uh, chip installation party, I got the deed done. It's on YouTube, I think. <laughs> um, and what I realized is this that me as a security geek, I stand on the side and I see a technology and I'm saying, hmm, interesting. There's a weakness, there's a weakness, there's a weakness, there's a weakness, there's a weakness. <sighs> this is never gonna work. And the entrepreneur is like, this is so cool. We can do this, we can do, it. oh, and we, like, don't think, I, I, we don't need you know, we, we don't need to, we figure it out as we go, and then this thing becomes a huge hit, and all those weaknesses that we pointed out are still in there, and they haven't been addressed, because we stood on the side and said, really? You know, I, I think in, in, to some extent, this is an attitude problem from the security geek side. And I say that as a security geek. So, when I was thinking of this chip implant, I thought of uh, the science fictions that I was just recently watching. This guy, Ronan here, uh, he has uh, the equivalent of a GPS tracker in his back, and he's being tracked through the universe by life-sucking aliens. Uh, <laughs> and Seven of Nine, my childhood hero, uh, as a plot device, every now and then there's a, a tracker in her head that uh, is turning on, and you know, uh, then Jane Wee saves the day, but uh, you can never know that until 40 minutes later. Uh, so this is what I was thinking of when I was thinking of chip implants. It's trackers. Um, so just step back uh, one step and think of what is a cyborg. One of the, you know, the keynote speaker yesterday, Karen Sandler, uh, she was speaking about how she really avoided, she didn't want to become a cyborg. When she got the peacemaker into her chest, uh, one of the issues for her was, I don't want to become a cyborg. But for me, it was like, I really want to become a cyborg. Uh, this is so cool, this is, uh, like, I, I, I don't know why, but it just feels, feels good. Um, 
So the original definition of a cyborg is a human being with bodily functions aided or controlled by technological devices. So in this case, we have the pacemaker or defibrillator up there. We have an insulin pump that is steadily attached to the body. This is an intrauterine device that you use so that you won't get pregnant. This is a schematics for um, dialysis. And does anyone know why Malala is in this picture? Uh, uh, Malala is the one who got shot in her, in her head in Pakistan by the Taliban. And when she got shot in the head, she lost her hearing on one side, and then she got a cochlear implant, uh, which is a hearing aid that you implant into the head. So I think that she's one of the most famous cyborgs out there. Um, the interesting thing about this cochlear implant, too, is that uh, there is a possibility to get superhuman hearing with a cochlear implant. Uh, it depends on, on the patient, uh, but there is a possibility to, for example, hear things 200 meters away or something like that, but it's not deemed ethical to tinker with this. And you're not allowed to do it yourself, you have to do it with your doctor, and your doctor is saying, sorry, this is against the code of ethics, we can't do it. So another definition of a cyborg is that uh, you have something implanted. And by this definition, I, uh, I am a cyborg. And the pacemaker and the intrauterine device, the hip um, breast implants, whatever, all of these can be counted as cyborg. Uh, and there is, of course, uh, a third definition. Cyborg is a human being with an electronic device implanted in or steadily attached to the body with the purpose of increasing individual senses or abilities beyond the occasional use of tools. So, and also by this definition, I would be a cyborg since I was 12. So, I didn't have to do the chip implant. <laughs> I could just have gone for the glasses. Um, I'm just wondering, who in here doesn't have a smartphone? We have two, two and a half people in here who don't, three and a half people who don't have a smartphone. Interesting. Um, so what people often ask about this is what kind of chip implant is this? It's the kind of uh, chip that you would have in your bank card or in your passport. Uh, it's an NTAG 2016, uh, complying with the ISO 14443. Uh, it's a tiny amount of storage on there. It's less than a kilobyte. Um, these have historically been used on cats and dogs, uh, but then they have had some kind of tissue that grows into the tissue of, uh, of the cats because for some reason, veterinarians aren't that good at piercers. I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> I, I had a, a real piercer do this implant for me. Um, it's a 12 millimeter biocompatible glass. Uh, it's, like, it's like a grain of rice, basically. And it's made to uh, be easily take, taken out of the body without issue because it's not going to grow into the body in any way. Uh, it has one and a half millimeter antenna, um, and that standard ISO 14443 is calling for a credit card sized antenna. So uh, this antenna makes it really hard to read these. And also, since my body is mostly water based, uh, it's even harder to read them. And uh, the mobile phone that I would usually use this with uh, has an NFC reader that doesn't get very much power. So it's very, very hard to use it. <laughs> but anyway, uh, it's a passive technology. So in order for me to be tracked, uh, we would have to have an infrastructure of very, very powerful antennas every, every meter, basically. Um, which is, you know, doable. I'm not sure, it's not, it's not the most practical way of tracking a person. And this is the main reason why I decided to do this. Also because I 
felt I needed to do uh, a risk assessment of this, and I needed to do it uh, by immersion. Uh, by immersion. Uh, since I realized that in order to succeed as an IT security person, I need to be able to talk to normal people. And I need to be able to talk to entre entrepreneurs, and I need to be able to uh, get them to understand what I'm saying. So that's one of the reasons why I did this too. So this, I'd say, isn't, uh, this is not a dangerous tracking device. But you know what is a dangerous tracking device? So uh, Richard, Richard Stallman calls this uh, the governmental tracking device, and some years ago people were like, oh my god, you're so paranoid. Well, of course, yeah, theoretically that can happen, but who would, would they really do that? Yes, they would. Uh, <laughs> we're tracked all the time with these governmental tracking devices. No, it's not, it's not, it's, it's not ideal uh, from a personally identifiable information perspective or a privacy uh, perspective. And the thing is, this happened by accident. Because we had this really nice technology of uh, mobile phones, and in order for mobile phones to work, you always need to triangulate the position of the person. Uh, and then that really smart technology merged with another really smart technology of the smartphone. And all of a sudden, we have unique identifiers that are continuously tracked and yes, you can turn off the tracking, but then it doesn't work. The whole idea of having a smartphone is to have the database of all of the world's knowledge in your pocket at all times. This is why we want it. It's, it's amazing. It's an amazing technology, but it is tracking us all the time. And it just happened. So, we don't want uh, the IoT to be something that happens to track us all the time. Uh, you know, the, the whole idea of uh, we would rather let someone free than put them into prison if when in doubt. Uh, the, the issue here is that that principle came along at a time where there was very little data about people, and you couldn't know whether or not uh, someone has done it, so it's better to let someone go than let them into prison, even if it's uh, a murderer. But nowadays, we have so much data on people. There is incredible amounts of metadata about me created all the time, uh, I mean, like, one of the really strange things is my phone is telling me, oh, you're in Vorwinkel Wuppertal. Would you like to know uh, the, uh, when the bus goes? And it's doing that all the time. And this is something that we're just used to. Uh, and if I w we will come to a point when turning off my phone uh, is a reason to be suspicious of what I'm doing. Um, so with this chip implant, I came into uh, a scene that's called the biohackers. And they are doing different things. They are doing uh, do-it-yourself do DNA labs uh, in the same way that people were doing do-it-yourself computing in the 70s. Uh, they are doing chip implants. They are doing quantified stuff. They are like tinkering with uh, food and stuff. They are tinkering with drugs. Uh, but basically, in, in its essence, it's a cool new way, name for good old keeping healthy. Um, so, for example, fitness trackers is something that I have been doing. I've been doing some glucose metering to see what happens to me when I eat sugar. Uh, I was pricking myself in the finger for like 200 times in two weeks. Uh, and I found out really interesting stuff about me, myself, with this, uh, without a without a, a physician or a, a doctor. But all of a sudden, we now have so much data about us, ourselves. Um, and uh, when I was doing uh, fitness tracking, I realized I'm getting too much data about myself, 
what's happening here is that I'm getting injured because instead of listening to, I have a bad knee, I'm listening to, oh, I'm going very slow. I need to pace up. Uh, I've been talking about this already. I'll skip it. So maybe you've already he heard this part. Big data is the new oil. I've been really wondering what do they really mean about this? What's, what's the point? What we are right now doing is like we're collecting lots and lots and lots of data in order to sell ads. Uh, and the ad economy is basically a dying economy. Uh, I'm not sure if this, like, I don't really believe in this, but this is uh, a par uh, an axiom that is being told over and over again, and this is also the reason why we want to know so much about people. Um, and going back to the general data protection regulation and the privacy issues, I think it's, it's kind of really easy. I, I think when it comes to uh, Internet of Things, when it comes to biohacking, when it comes to tracking people, there's a very simple principle. Do not collect data without informed consent. Informed consent does not mean an end user license agreement that is 25 pages. Informed consent does not mean if you want to use this app that you need to give me access to all of your data. And there is only one way of choosing between here. That's not informed consent. I think uh, when it comes to privacy data, we can think of it about in the same way uh, as with violence, that by default, violence is illegal, but under some certain circumstances, we can say, you are allowed to punch me in the face because we're in a boxing match. Uh, or like, we don't have any rules here because this is MMA. Uh, but just because MMA does exist doesn't mean that uh, we are allowed to kick each other in the face on the street. So I think that if we cohere to this small principle, we will come a very long way. Thank you. I hope you have a lot of questions for me. What, what do you think is a good example of informed consent? Do you have a product that you use that you think is a good example? I find that I've, I've never seen any, any product that strikes the right balance, and I'm wondering what you think is ideal. OK, so do I have an example of informed consent in a very good way? Not out of the top of my head. And that's also interesting. Like, Eight months from now, we're going to have a regulation that says that you have to pay 4% of your revenue uh, if, you're not, uh, if you're not acquiring informed consent from all of your customers. But still, we don't have a very good idea about what this informed consent would look like. Um, uh, share who? 4% uh, uh, you have. Um, in the GDPR, the highest penalty that you would have to pay is 4% of your, of your company's revenue annually. Uh, yes, government. Um, yeah. No, so I, I think that there are some VPN uh, services out there that are specializing in privacy, where they have a very, where they are really good at communicating what they are collecting. Um, I don't know, the privacy bear, or no, tunnel, pri tunnel bear, it's called tunnel bear. Um, so I think that there are some special cases where this is really, uh, where this is good and done in a good way. Uh, actually, yesterday I was talking to a guy who has a Tesla, and in the Tesla, uh, every now and then, apparently, uh, he is presented with, by the way, we're tracking you in this way. <laughs> uh, which is, you know, nice because uh, it's good that they are trying to inform people. But if they're trying to inform people in a way that is boring, 
Uh, that's also a convenient way of, of saying, well, we did inform you. Yes? Uh, I think uh, you were looking for the definition of a cyborg, and uh, you showed several of them. Mm -hmm. I think uh, maybe a more relevant one would be someone who relies on computers which have executable code inside of them, inside of your body, because there's a bigger distinction between mere technology and executable so you're coming here with a, an, an alternative um, definition of a cyborg that has to do with executables inside of your body. And yes, this is also another definition of cyborg. I think that both the Internet of Things and the cyborgs and all the interesting stuff are really hard to uh, coherently define. So that's why I used three um, definitions and we can use more of them. Uh, at the beginning, you said that uh, the consumers do not really care about the security of uh, IoT devices, or they do care, but they do not really understand what's going on. Uh, the problem is we're looking at uh, pr a price-sensitive area. So when a consumer goes to the supermarket and sees an internet-enabled baby cam, for example, and it's the statement, military-grade security on the packaging for $30. So he's going to say, well, that has military-grade security. But if you look at a proper IoT device like, for example, the Ring Video Doorbell, which is actually the only device I think that it is a properly designed IoT device, it costs at least $200. So what you're saying is basically that there is a price issue in the IoT that people are not prepared to pay the price that you would actually have to pay for a um, um, device with uh, a bit of more CPU power maybe that will actually be able to have re uh, reasonable key management. Yeah, uh, it's absolutely an issue that the, the market is simply, um, the cost of these devices are simply too low at the moment. Sorry, there's another. Yeah, you're. So are there uh, initiatives to uh, educate consumers on the issues of uh, IoT security? Um, yes, of course there are. I think that we're in the beginning of realizing that talking to users and not, not saying, well, you used it the wrong way, it's not a bug, it's a feature. Uh, I think we're in, in the cradle of creating something, uh, of, of understanding that user interaction and user experience is actually things that are important, and they are also important for security. Uh, until now, there are, like, there are so many uh, secure, messagings, uh, secure messaging apps and secure messaging services uh, that are really secure and have focused on this. Um, but that are use, unusable for normal people because normal people, they don't want it to take half an hour uh, to, they don't want to, they don't want to understand the OSI model. They don't want it to take half an hour to, to configure this. They don't want to Google to get it to understand, uh, to understand this. They want it to work intuitively. And uh, we, uh, so we basically before we had like secure things and usable things. And at the moment, these are slowly starting to merge because the security people are finally understanding that, well, people are using Snapchat, you know. They are sending dick pics and they are thinking, hey, this is secure now because it's only shown for 10 seconds. Yes, but it's logged and it's put, it's retained on a server where you will never reach it. 
So your, all of your dick pics <laughs> are in the cloud. Uh, but you have a feeling of security because you don't see it and no one else can see it until that cervix attack. Uh, whereas we now, for example, with the signal have the disappearing messages where you can send your dick pics nice and, uh, and they will disappear. And they will actually disappear. Um, and signal is usable and signal has GIFs and signal has you know, lots of stuff. We finally have many secure apps that actually are a bit more fun. And I think that's a key to the issue. Uh, so we had you before that, maybe. Mm -hmm. Well, there is uh, one initiative in, in London that I know of that's called IoT.watch, I think. Uh, it's sponsored by Bosch, and, but it's a grassroots movement. Um, and that's basically the one that I have from the top of my head. Um, yes? Uh, when you talked about Signal, the problem with Signal is by default, uh, it has some key management built in into the application, so it's not 100% secure. You have to uh, take an extra step to verify the key through another channel. But if you look at an application like Threema, with it, which won't work unless you do the offline key verification, uh, that's a bit more secure. I think that the key management issue is something that we uh, I, that will follow me through the next 40 years of my career. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is hard. The, the problem itself, uh, the same problem presents itself in WhatsApp and even iMessage. Those applications are secure enough, but they're not really secure because if you want real security, it's very inconvenient. Well, if you want real security, you will have to watch uh, the Americans on Netflix to get some tips on how you can do that. You have to kill people, <laughs> you know. Uh, you yeah. have to meet in a park naked without exactly. anybody around. Yeah, so, so uh, per perfect security is often not uh, desirable even. Well, uh, you're saying that wh whenever uh, d data is collected, it will be misused. And, uh, uh, well, maybe it doesn't have to be misused by the company in, in question, but then they file for insolvency and they sell whatever asset they have, and their asset have, happen to be big data. Oh, or they get hacked because they don't know a first thing about uh, security and they don't know how to Google. Um, you can see very, very much things, for example, They collect it every, uh, you're saying that the uh, German law requires the electricity company to, to uh, collect your uh, electricity consumption data uh, once a month, but they're doing it every minute. They are allowed to do it once a month. Yeah. Once a year. And this is also the issue about regulation. Uh, there are so many rules. We are breaking rules every day. And still, for some reason, regulation kind of works most of the time or sometimes and it's better to have a 
society that is built on, on uh, explicit regulation than to not have it. But just because a re regulation exists doesn't mean that it's followed. Yeah, uh, for this reason, I would say that uh, we must regard per, uh, power consumption as personally identifiable data because you can learn a lot, a lot, a lot about a person from that. For example, now in the hotel that we're staying, uh, most probably there is air condition that uh, has a humidity sensor and a carbon dioxide sensor that can sense whenever we're sleeping, whenever we're showering, whether or not we're having sex, um, and this is something that could be used, you know. Uh, you, can, you can see a, very, a spike when someone wakes up. It's like, and, and then you can make me do some more breakfast but because you see that there are many people that just woke up. There are many people who just made a shower and why don't we do that? Um, that's a use case for uh, that IoT device and for the side channel of uh, an air condition that is IoT connected. Question is, is this something desirable? I don't know. Yeah. In the back, we had a person. So I agree that regulations are a problem to some degree, but power and you know, suggest that they are not government. Who should do what, you said? Um, instead of having regulations to like, protect, take care of security. Who, who should regulate, if, not, if the government doesn't regulate the IoT, who should? I think that, and first and foremost, what really needs to be tried is a business, is a CSR, well, a company's social responsibility, to take uh, privacy matters and make it into something, something marketable, saying that, hey, you're paying a real, it makes a real difference if you're buying this thing for $30 or for $60 because what we are doing is that we're selling a product. What they are doing is that they are selling you. And I think uh, it needs to come from many, many different uh, places. I think that the open source uh, world is really beautiful in this way that it can both be monetized and also used uh, by people who are idealists at the same time. Uh, it doesn't need necessarily need to exclude each other. But you speak about regulation. How would it be possible at the world level to make regulation? We will have always two, three, five, ten countries who will never make regulation. Yeah. And they will make it too strong. Global regulation is always an issue, is what you're How saying. And, uh, yeah. Uh, Nine years ago now, I started to be, uh, when I was in the environmental movement, I started to go to these UNFCCC uh, talks in Poznan and then in Copenhagen. And what I realized there is that there are two types of global regulation. There's the one that is good and strong, like the Child Convention, that no one is following. Or there is the one that everyone is following that is so watered down that it doesn't make any sense. Uh, so I quickly realized that I was so de de disillusionized uh, in that situation in 2008, and the rest of the environmental movement came after me in 2009 when they also realized that this Copenhagen Treaty doesn't go anywhere. Uh, so I think that's also a reason why I am feeling strongly that we don't need that regulation can be used for good, but frankly, how often is it used for good? How often does it have the intended purpose, uh, the intended outcome? Uh, to follow up on the question, what we can do is we can educate people because we cannot make a regulation that will expand the world. So let's say, if, uh, 
the more people who have incidents because of IoT devices, the more people will learn that they need to uh, hold, raise the bar, so to speak, on the devices they buy. Uh, so it's enough to have a certification in one country, and that stamp would be put on the IoT devices that uh, have a minimum set of security features, or at least uh, 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 not made without security in mind, uh, so to speak, and let the people vote with their money. So, basically, you're, what you're saying is that we need, first and foremost, uh, the market to, to mature. mature, and secondly, that we don't need global certification, uh, a, a global regulation, because if uh, we have the GDPR, for example, that only applies to 500 million people in the world, but we have a global market and everything is made in China, so everything in the world will be uh, made to comply with this, ideally. Uh, in the same way that the FDA has a very strong power over how medical devices and medicines look in the rest of the world, too. So I don't know who, how we are with time. Three minutes. Three minutes. Is there anyone who hasn't spoken who has uh, a question? Come on, I don't bite. So, do we have uh, an extreme implicit trust in the government in Sweden? Yes. <laughs> uh, so, uh, well, uh, I think that um, Sweden has been used by many companies as uh, a way to test things because very, people tend to be very trend sensitive and people tend to be extremely trusting and uh, tend, tend to like to do new things. Um, so, like one of the use cases that they're trying for the uh, chip implant is to use them as payment, as wallet, uh, which is a bad use case because these NFC MyFair chips, they are not made with any kind of security in mind, so they are so easily cracked. And there are like uh, hacker kits that you can get for 40 euros uh, that are made here at the University in Bochum, actually. Um, it's a very bad idea to make a new infrastructure that is built on that NFC technology that I have in my hand. However, the next ones that actually have some kind of security in mind, like the Java card, might be a way to do this. Uh, but I'm digressing, because what I wanted to say is that uh, there tend to be a lot of articles done about the cashless society in Sweden. And I, I didn't understand this. Like, of course, you can use cash all over, uh, except when was the last time I used cash? The last time I used cash, I was in Germany. Uh, <laughs> and um, talking about like baselines and diverting from baselines and that being a suspicious thing, I always go to the same shop, I always shop the same things, and I always pay with the same card. Uh, so I think that one can read so much interesting data out of what I'm buying and when. Um, and this is something that I'm readily giving away and that we all are giving away so easily because we are implicitly trusting the banks and we are implicitly trusting the state. And it's no issue for the Swedes that all of a sudden there is no money that isn't tracked. This just happened. Yeah? Uh, you trust them? But if you just change something by um, then you have, with your with the goods you buy, you can really find out very many things about the person paying you that's very hard to You see, you can often become pregnant, then somebody loses his job or change uh, the job. Everything else you can find out out of the, the job. 
Yeah, you can, you can learn so much about people from what they are buying and what they are buying with, with card. So I know that I should use cash, but the thing is, interestingly enough, increasingly there are signs saying uh, no cash, we only take credit card and swish. And swish is a way of paying with your mobile phone and your number, mobile number, and your mobile bank ID. Yeah. So I think that's all. Thank you all guys.